back. Are we live? Can you hear me? Very good. Hello. Welcome back, everyone. Um, my name is Annabelle Liu, and I am very excited to introduce these next three speakers. Uh, first, we have Brandon Harris, who is senior designer of Wikimedia Foundation, and legend has it, is made entirely from steel wool and whiskey. Interesting. Um, he's also an instructor at General Assembly in San Francisco, teaching user experience design. Aside from his duties as senior designer, he's served the foundation in additional capacities. He was awarded Staff Member of the Year in 2012 by Jimmy Wales, served as a spokesperson during the 2011-2012 fundraiser, earning over $8 million for the foundation, and he designed the 2012 anti-SOPA PIPA blackout system for the English Wikipedia. He is going to talk to you today about dragon slaying. Please welcome Brandon Harris. Hi. So, uh, my name is Brandon Harris, as she just said. I'm having crazy computer problems today. Uh, so we're taking a little bit of time to get there. Uh, this talk is titled The State of the Wiki, and it's kind of a weird uh, thing to start with. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Diderot, uh, Dennis Diderot, the inventor of the encyclopedia. We're going to talk a little bit about social machine concepts, eventualism and technology, motivations, and then we're going to slay some dragons. So this talk is called The State of the Wiki. And uh, I didn't name it, uh, and neither did Ed or anyone else. We're actually not sure where the name came from. It just was too late to fix it because it was on the, uh, the program. So I'm going to retitle it right now. Uh, it's not the state of the wiki. It's actually, we're just going to call it eventualism. Except, well, that's not a real word, is it? So maybe it's not that. Let's just go with dragon slaying. So. Denis Diderot. He was uh, a French philosopher who was the primary motivator behind the encyclopedia, which was the first encyclopedia to be written by several named contributors. There were other encyclopedias in the past, and they were written by, maybe written by multiple people, but there was like one person who got the credit for it. His encyclopedia was extremely controversial for its time, which was the Enlightenment. The encyclopedia's aim was to change the way that people think. It ended up at 28 volumes with over 71,000 articles and over 3,000 illustrations. And at the time, people hated it. It was seen by many groups as a threat because the encyclopedia kind of took for granted some basic ideas like tolerance, freedom of thought, and science. At one point, the French government suspended its privileges, uh, but they continued on writing in secret. Um, even having such luminaries as Madame Pompadour uh, support it in the background. Now, I wonder if Diderot knew what he had done back then. If he understood the domino trail that he had flicked off and started all the way down. I, I wonder, even today, 200 years later, do we even understand what he did. And then that question actually begs to be asked about Wikipedia. Let's move on to social machines. So Wikipedia's logo, I think, is actually a great example of a social machine story. It literally describes what we do. The context here is that every single one of us has our own puzzle pieces for the sum of human knowledge, and we all bring it to the same part. Everybody puts it together. Uh, we're working to assemble a great work, and it's possibly one that will never be completed, hence the open top. From a designer's perspective, the logo itself can be extremely difficult to work with. Uh, it doesn't reduce well. If you get below 32 pixels, it's completely uh, amorphous. It looks strange when you put it on anything except a white background because it's a 3D model and the generation occurred on a white background. Uh, it can be extremely frustrating to work with, which is pretty much like the rest of the movement. <laughs> but the symbolism is pure. 
many languages, many entities coming together to create something larger, like ants. Uh, maybe this is our best, no, actually, I think that's a really crappy metaphor for our movement, because uh, we're all different, and ants sort of operate to the same drummer. Uh, the tension between us is actually kind of how it works. When, when everybody's together on something, you, you fall apart pretty easily. So maybe that's not our social machine. Maybe our social machine is more like clockwork. But the more I think of that, I thought about that, I was like, mm, no, that doesn't feel right either. Because this is sort of a, it is a machine. And a social machine is not a machine. A social machine is its people. So I thought about it and I realized that there was really only one thing that we are. We are a bunch of people who are riding a glacier yeah. So glaciers, people just normally think of them as these giant ice cubes. They're really cold. They don't really think about what they do a lot of times. A glacier is a pretty terribly powerful thing. Um, they take forever to do it, but they flatten mountains. Sometimes they create mountains. They'll furrow valleys. They do all this stuff. They, res they reshape the planet constantly, and they just do it very, very slowly. Now, our movement is a grand event, and it's an event that moves slowly but with an inexhaustible purpose. And it's a great glacier, and we're all riding on it. Which brings me to eventualism. Now, eventualism is a meta Wikipedian term. Uh, it, it, it describes the idea that eventually, everything gets right. Everything will be, you know, eventually all the articles will be complete, or eventually the wrong articles will be removed. It's a perspective that focuses on a long game and not local immediate goal. The far future rather than tomorrow. Now there's several examples of things that, that we can see that are eventual and are happening right now. Uh, we're in England, so it's a little different, but in the United States of America, support for same-sex marriage is a really good example of an eventuality. In 2003, only 33% of the population thought that this was possibly a good idea, and within a decade, that number had risen to 49%. Every year, it increases by about 2%, the acceptance rate of same-sex marriage. That means that that fight's over. It's eventually, it's an eventualism. It is finished. It will happen. So uh, we don't really have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> Woohoo! There are many things that are eventual. Uh, we will eventually find new prime numbers. It's going to take some time, computing power, but we'll do it. We'll probably find new elements, eventually. Technology is a great way to describe eventualism. Uh, records were eventually replaced by cassette tapes only to later be replaced by compact discs. A few years back, there was a format war between Blu-ray and HD DVD. Who was gonna win the competing conflict? And I gotta tell you, I knew back then, right when they announced it, who had won already, and it was neither one of them. It was digital downloads. Eventualism, the technology changes. The Technology is really, actually a really good mechanism for, for detecting the passage of time. So things that were new and modern one day become stale and fall into disuse and decay the next day. William Gibson has a quote from a book called Burning Chrome uh, that says, the street finds its own use for things. And he was talking about how we build and we don't necessarily know what it's gonna be used as. So, I am a member of Generation X, the most dissatisfied generation. So growing up, cameras had this thing called film. Now for you younger members of the audience, film was a consumable resource and fairly expensive. And a roll of film had 32 exposures, and you'd, once you'd taken all your pictures, you would go out to these things that are now mythical called a photo mat, and you'd drop it off, and then you would get developed and they would be printed out on paper. Film was a precious commodity, and unless you were crazy or rich, you rarely used it arbitrarily, frivolously, or pointlessly. And you certainly never take a selfie. <laughs> unless you're this guy. But Buzz Aldrin probably wasn't paying for his film. 
So to me, um, actually, selfies are an interesting indicator of the street finding its own use for a kind of technology. Uh, for the longest time, I didn't understand them, and this is mostly my Generation X film camera bias. Uh, you see, when I understood it, it was like, oh, yeah. Selfies aren't pointless or arbitrary. They're actually a newer, organic form of communication. And it, 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 when someone takes a selfie, if I take a selfie and I publish it, I'm actually making a statement to the world. I'm, 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 I'm broadcasting my state. I'm saying, I'm in a good mood. I, look at how great I am. Look where I am. Look at what I'm doing. Be proud of me. You know, they, 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 you show them to people because you want them to be impressed. You show them to people because you want to share your life. It's not the same thing as a regular photograph. And pictures are, you know, a thousand words. So once I realized that, I fell in love with the idea. Now, I don't really, I don't really take a lot of selfies. because <laughs> I'm going to do that real quick, though. So. Let's get everybody back there. Oh, I'll flip that camera. I'm going to send that to my mom. She's going to be real happy about that. So whenever I see a selfie, I try to read them with compassion and I assume good faith because they're all taken by other living creatures who are riding on this eventualism glacier with me. Like Dumisama and Herard, or Abby, Delphine and Arna, Maggie, Kim, Anna and Anna, Daniel and Daniel. Jared, Shira, Victor, Pats, Molly and Emily, Gail, these three weirdos. <laughs> I mean, look at that. They're happy as clams. <laughs> this troublemaker. <laughs> and these two jerks. Now, we can't always predict the passage of time, how it's going to affect technology or what is available or even how we're going to use it. We just have to know that the technology eventually changes and that the street will eventually find its own use for it. Which brings me to my next part, which is about finding, you know, why we do these things, our motivations. Now, each one of us has chosen to ride the glacier for our own reasons. Some people are doing it because uh, they want to teach, they want to share medical knowledge, they want to correct errors. Some people have an obsessive compulsive need to fill out an article about every train stop in the UK. Or, you know, yeah, I see, somebody just raised their hand. I know what I'm talking about right there, right? Now, I've never really told anybody what my motivation is, why I do this, but I'm gonna do it today. This is Howard Gobioff. He's the most intelligent man I have ever met in my life. He's a name that's hidden in history for the most part, but he's hugely responsible for how the internet works today. Because Howard, when he got his doctorate, he wrote this thing called the Google File System. And it's pretty much what causes Google to work. He was a very early employee at the search engine. And uh, when, he, when he was there, I was actually working at a competing place called Ink to Me that eventually just got destroyed, eaten up by Yahoo. Now, it's important to understand the context of uh, how Howard and I work. Um, in 2000, I went to Nepal for a long time. I had to get as far away from my life in San Francisco. Uh, I just was done. And going to the top of the world just felt like the right place to do it. So I left San Francisco, uh, one person, and I came back a completely different creature. I shaved my head, <laughs> just, yeah, really, and decided that I wanted to be healthier. And that meant that I like, was going to start working out. And I mentioned this to Howard, and with his usual practicality, uh, he told me to meet him at this local gym at 7 a.m. on Monday, which I'm like, oh, <laughs> boy because 7 a.m. doesn't exist for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but it sure as hell doesn't for me. So we lifted weights for several years. He was a short guy, burly, burly dude. Uh, way outweighed me by a lot. And every day we'd weigh ourselves, and then he would actually do the math in his head, and he'd calculate, well, today I weigh 1.32 Brandons. That's how we measure it. Some days he'd weigh more, some days he'd weigh less. 
We worked out for a long time. And then one day he had a rotator cuff injury and he started having to go, you know, do physical therapy and fix it. And eventually he moved to Tokyo to help set up a Google office there. And then eventually he moved to New York. And then eventually he died. He had been living with lymphoma for years and years and had told no one. I mean, I guess he didn't want to be that guy, you know, the one you talk about with like a whisper, that poor bastard, he's got cancer. He didn't want to like lose his hair or he didn't want to be sicker. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Only his brother knew about this and only because the hospital made Howard call his next of kin in his last days. I mean, without doubt, I mean, probably know he would have died unknown. To this day, I am filled with a great and terrible grief and a howling rage. I'm angry because my friend died and I was unable to be there. I was not able to go and hold his hand at the end and watch him slip into the black and let him know that people loved him. He died alone, and that makes me so angry. I'm filled with rage. And that's my motivation. He was my friend, and I loved him. And I still do. Because the reason this is my motivation is that eventually, eventualism, we will cure cancer. Somewhere on this planet, now or in the future, there exists a child inside whose brain exists the right moment of clarity that will unlock this cure, set the right prions working, the right chemicals, who knows. One day, eventually, she will make herself known to us. Eventually, we will colonize Mars. We will do eventual things that will appear as magic. Eventually, we will develop technology and science to reach the stars. Eventually, we will end oppression. Education is our silver bullet. It is a weapon of mass instruction. And with it, we can end oppression because you can't oppress a person who knows that they're being oppressed. With education comes understanding, with understanding comes tolerance. And tolerance is like an infection it roots deep into your brain, and it causes you to seek out compromises and dissolve your hostilities. And with that, with that, we can abolish war, eventually. We will slay our dragons, dead. Yeah, it took me a while. So, eventualism. This isn't a new idea, by the way. Other people have said it. They just said it better. They're probably smarter. See, Gandhi was an eventualist. So, this is what I mean about dragon slaying. Do you know, really, actually that's a shitty title anyway. Let's, uh, let's go back to eventualism. But then, when you think about it, we're on this moving glacier, very slow. Every moment is a quantum state of what we are. And eventualism is a state. It's not the title either. This is the state of the wiki. We are eventual, and that's what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon.
is going to have to go in VGA. Okay. Okay, so while we're messing about with, with technology and stuff, I can actually remember bits of my talk. Um, yeah, so uh, other than uh, running little bits of universities, I spend a lot of my time researching uh, where technology and learning meet or don't meet. And uh, Wikipedia comes up an awful lot when I'm doing that work. Uh, so the title of my talk is... Lovely. What's left to teach now that Wikipedia has done everyone's homework? And I still can't quite decide whether that's a facetious title or not. Perhaps you can decide for yourselves uh, as I go through this. Um, now, I know you guys are quite you know, focused on the idea of bias, so I'm going to be upfront and say that uh, I really, really like Wikipedia. Okay, So you're going to have to take that into account when you critically evaluate my talk. Uh, bits and bobs to do with the talk are on that URL there, so uh, you, can, you can visit that rather than scroll lots of notes, assuming you were going to do that. So, first question. Why are you listening to this talk? Okay, this is where the room clears. Um, I think one possible answer is because it's not a Wikipedia page, okay? Because if it was a Wikipedia page, you wouldn't need to come to the talk. Another way of looking at that is, is hopefully, I'm not just going to tell you an answer to a straightforward question which is already kind of an existing known piece of knowledge. That would be a bit dull. Hopefully, I'm going to pose some questions and I'm going to bring some things together, okay? And hopefully, I might provide an interesting perspective. And kind of linked to that uh, statement is this one, okay? If the answer to your homework you've set is a Wikipedia page, then you need to change the way you teach, all right? Now, there's a fundamental problem in that statement, and I'm going to come back to it later on, okay? But I'll give you a clue. The problem is not Wikipedia. Now, when, when, when we're talking in this kind of area, quite often, uh, discussions end up being at cross-purposes. So you talk for a long time, and then people say, yeah, but how's that going to help my students pass their exams? And you're like, no, you've got, you know, we've been talking at cross-purposes, okay? So what I want to do is just split out quickly the difference, as I see it, between education and learning. And what I mean by that is education is those institutions and those systems, so it's schools, it's universities, it's roles like teachers, lecturers, it's the curriculum, it's assessment, it's validation, okay? It's that formal setup. Learning is much bigger than that. Now, you, hopefully, there's a big overlap, all right? Um, but I was sitting near Jimmy Wales yesterday. Yeah, it was quite exciting. And, um, and he made the point that, you know, formal education, there's probably about the same amount of formal education going on now as there was 15 years ago, but informal learning has exploded, and Wikipedia has a lot to do with that. And I think it's useful to separate these things out, okay? Now... Uh, so I undertook some research that was funded by uh, JISC in this country and OCLC, big library organization in America. And we went around talking to a lot of students all the way from late stage secondary school all the way up through university and some staff at university as well. And we were asking them general questions of how they went about learning using technology. Because the education sector doesn't have that, that clear an idea of how students go about learning now because of the web, okay? So this is one of the things we're exploring. And this is a UK-based school student. And what you can see here is how, they, how they're kind of confusing that idea of education and learning, OK? So they're basically saying around Wikipedia. So they're sort of saying, um, Wikipedia is great. I read it all the time for stuff that I'm interested in, but I wouldn't use it for education because it's not reliable, OK? So you see the problem there, OK? We know that Wikipedia is incredibly popular for people who want to know stuff and want to learn stuff, and yet somehow its relationship with the education sector is problematic, as we can see from this, okay? So, so my, you know, my question is, why is that subversive? You know, and why would you choose to say that having graduated? <laughs> rather than perhaps during your course. Because we know, everybody knows, everybody involved in education knows that this happens most of the time. And awful. It's not the only thing that happens. And yet somehow that's, you know, that's a subversive thing to say. And this is the classic. This is the absolute classic. I really like this student. It's, it, you know, it's, it, you know, of course they're using Wikipedia, it's really convenient, it works really well, but don't mention it, you know, don't mention it. And this is just quoting Wikipedia. Um, I've actually got a, a piece from a participant that says, and this, this was um, from America, where they said, actually, if you just mention Wikipedia in the classroom, then you kind of get pointed at and laughed at. 
It's actually worse in America than it is in the UK for some reason. Um, and uh, that's still a jo- it's still a joke in our culture in some senses. Um, you know, it, you watch a sitcom and somebody you know, uh, says, oh, I've, I found this fact out, and the other character says, oh, where do you get that from? And the first character says, Wikipedia, and everybody laughs. Okay? That is still a thing. But why, why is that the case? Okay? And I think there is a problem here. And it's generating what I, what I rather emotively call the learning black market, okay? Which is that either, because of either explicit or implicit messages that educational institutions are giving out, students, learners, are not making visible to their educational institutions the fact that they're using Wikipedia an awful lot and other non-traditional sources, okay? And so what this means is that students are having to put a lot of effort into negotiating the dissonance between the way they actually learn and what they feel they should make visible as, as legitimate learning practices to their institutions. Okay? So, so they're put in a difficult position. And we're not really, educational establishments aren't necessarily having a conversation about that. Not generally. I mean, obviously, at this conference, you're going to hear a lot of stuff about people who are being innovative and forward thinking and using Wikipedia and all the rest of it. But generally speaking, it's not great out there in terms of the way that Wikipedia intersects with education. And, and, and something fundamental is going on, okay? I mean, you know, I think that um, Brendan's talk was fantastic from, Brendan's talk was fantastic from, from, from that point of view, that, you know, he's really questioning, well, what is this all about, okay? Um, in that drive to bring together all this knowledge, you have the, you're actually having this massive effect on things around you, especially the education system. And what you can see here from this, this is a university-level student from... from um, uh, America, and you can see that the, the existence of Wikipedia is, 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 has encouraged them to ask fundamental epistemic questions about the nature of knowledge, which is a good thing that they're asking that question. Okay? So the problem with Wikipedia is anybody can, anybody can write it. But wait a minute, anybody can write a website, and anybody could write a journal. Well, maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. Okay? So you come up with this, well, what, what makes somebody an expert? Okay? Because we know that a lot of your editors are experts, but in my world, when I thought about it quite a lot, I decided an expert was anybody who got paid by a university. Do you see, do you see what I mean? So it's starting to disrupt the, those kind of, you know, the, in some ways, the nature, it's, it's disrupting the nature of credibility. And credibility is a great way into this, okay? Because in effect, that previous student was just trying, was, was dealing with, well, what, what makes something credible? And what I think's happened is, we can think of it in terms of currencies of credibility, okay? So there's a traditional currency of credibility, which is, you know, universities, academics, publishing houses, um, its format. You know, we're, we're culturally still very tied to the notion of the book and the journal and the paper, okay? Um, and that's a very stable currency. It's been around for, for, for a long time. It's not, gonna, it's not necessarily going to waver. But then there's this new currency, which is the currency of the web. And Wikipedia is very much part of that. So it's sources that have been constructed in a non-traditional way. It's likes, it's followers, it's comments. Okay? And this currency is highly unstable. Its value changes radically depending on the context you're using it in. And there is an, ex- an exchange rate if you like, between these two currencies. So the exchange rate from the traditional currency out onto the web is pretty good. If you're a professor and you appear on the web, you bring a lot of credibility with you. The exchange rate in the other direction is incredibly poor, but it's changing. So there are people, for example, who are employed by universities, and in part the reason they've been employed is because they've got 30,000 Twitter followers. That's beginning to happen. So we can see that shifting. So really then, the question is, um, why is Wikipedia not credible in an educational context, for the most part, okay? And we could see what's... I mean, this is the extreme end of that kind of discussion, really. So this is the Berkman Center. And they're saying, well, what's happened is, is that, is that th- those, those markers, those touchstones for credibility have kind of fallen away, and credibility has become very relativistic. And I'm not sure I agree with that, but certainly the Berkman Center are a very credible organization to discuss the fact that credibility is no longer credible, okay? So it's getting confusing out there, okay? And that's your fault. <laughs> um, so why is, why is Wikipedia 
you know, why does it struggle to find credibility? Well, one of the reasons might be because it doesn't fit with one of the best ideas I've ever had, all right? Which is frustrating. But because I'm an academic, I'm going to claim that the fact it doesn't fit is another reason why my idea is quite good, all right? Because, you know, that's how we work. Um, so you might remember Mark Prensky's Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants idea, which is based on age and technical skill. It's a generational thing. I think we've, you know, a lot of people have moved on from that. This idea, Visitors and Residents, is about people's motivation to engage with the web. So it's based on a motivation to engage, and it's a continuum. So you're, it's not two people, and you will engage in these modes in various ways, depending on what context you're in. But let's say you're in visitor mode, you're perceiving the web as like a series of tools. Okay, so you decide what you want to do, you go online, you open up the untidy toolbox of the web, you take out the tool you think is going to work for you, you do the job you want to do, you put it back, you close the lid, and you log off. You don't leave a social trace. So, Google, read Wikipedia, offline. That's classic. It's quite similar to the way we've been functioning with knowledge forever. Whereas at the resident end of the continuum, you're going to be thinking about the web as a series of spaces or places. Places where other people are, okay? So you're going to go online to be with other people, to express your identity, to get involved in discourse, to make comments. And you're going to be much more visible, and when you go offline, you're going to leave a social trace. And everything in between. Okay, so somewhere in the middle there, you might be part of smaller communities that have kind of got bounded edges to them. Now, in terms of consuming Wikipedia, it's very simple. It's up to the visitor end. Very straightforward. That bit's easy. In terms of the way Wikipedia is created, well, it, we definitely know it isn't you know, part of that traditional currency. We definitely know it's not created in the kind of one academic writes something, they're an expert, and they just throw it out there onto the web. But somehow, it's also not at the resident end either. It doesn't quite fit with that kind of cult of the individual, social media, super visible, hey, look at me, you know, way that the web works. And when you look at the user pages, they're a little bit spooky. For somebody like me that perhaps isn't a direct member of the community, they're a little bit boy scouty in some sense, with all the barn stars and things like that. And, you know, and that's because you're trading in, in, in edits and you're trading in the information that you're, that you're creating. That's, that's the currency that's being used. But my point is that perhaps one of the reasons that Wikipedia struggles with credibility in an educational context is because it doesn't fit traditional cultures, and it doesn't fit the web culture either in some senses. Maybe that's right, maybe it's not. <clears throat> yeah, that's just, uh, yeah, okay, moving on. So, um, I love Wikipedia, did I mention that? And what you end up with is things like this, which, which, is, my, which is basically my, my favorite page I've ever found on Wikipedia, which is a side effect of this, this, this incredible project to put together all this knowledge. This is the uh, page uh, that tells you when it's a good idea to use the ignore all the rules rule. And this is a decision flowchart tree that you can go through, this is on Wikipedia, to help you decide if you should follow the rules or if you should follow the rule that tells you to ignore all the rules rule. Okay, something like that anyway. So you could, okay, this is not, this is, this is crazy stuff. Okay, I think it's wonderful, I really like it. But it's, it's tricky business. The other reason that perhaps maybe Wikipedia is incredible is this old classic, okay? Which is that, oh, anybody can write it, so you know, you don't know, it might not be accurate. And, and we know that this is wrong, okay? And we've known that this is wrong for years. And as an organization, you guys have been proving that for, for years, and yet somehow, the education system is still going, no, nah, I don't really want to think about it. Do you know what I mean? It's not even as if they're not disagreeing, because you can't, because it's blatantly not true. But they're, somehow they're still not engaging. This is a red herring. This is what I call the lazy person's response to Wikipedia. It's basically what you say if you haven't thought about it. So my uh, point of view is that I think the reality here in terms of credibility is, is much more subtle and much more interesting, I hope. So, think less, find more is my suggested strap line for Google, okay? Uh, yeah, I haven't put it in front of them, I don't think they'll go for it, okay? But if you think about what they're selling, it's this 
concept. Um, when, we've, uh, when we've interviewed students, one of the questions that we uh, used, which is a really great question, was essentially, if you could have anything that would help you with learning that would be ideal for you, what would it be? Completely open question. And a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them essentially described Google, but perfect Google, okay? So a Google whereby you type in the, uh, a question and you, you'd know that the top result was correct, okay? So let's just think about that from an educational point of view because it's quite, it's, it's fascinating, okay? So my idea and probably your idea of research or what you'd have to do to do an assignment would be to seek out various sources to critically evaluate them and to synthesize them into a cogent argument. Okay? That's a form of research. To some of these students, that's what you had to do because the technology doesn't quite work well enough yet. Okay? They want, they're being sold this idea that if Google worked a little bit better, then they'd know that the top result was correct and they could use it without having to think. So you can see how that might be in tension with the education system. <laughs> All right? But that's what they're being sold. And it's not their fault, and I don't think Google are trying to be evil. It's a side effect of what's going on. So here's the problem. And it's not that, Google, it's not that Wikipedia is um, inaccurate. It's not that anybody can edit it. It's that it's too good. <laughs> it's too easy. And that's definitely your fault, OK? So if you could make it worse, you know, we'd be much happier. And what's happened here is, is not to do with those individual chunks of knowledge, okay? I think it's a loss of ontology. I did have this slide as a loss of taxonomy, and then I thought perhaps it's ontology, and then I checked on Wikipedia and I got a bit confused and I stuck to ontology. Anyway, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is, okay? I'll be honest with you, that one's a tough one. You know, the knowledge used to be physical, it used to be in books. Okay, and so if you wanted to find out a piece of information, I'm not pretending you don't know this already, I'm constructing an argument. All right. If you wanted to find a piece of information out, you'd have to know which chapter, of which book, on which shelf, in which library. Okay? So to find that piece of knowledge, you had to engage in the structure of knowledge, that map, that model of knowledge, the ontology, the Dewey Decimal System, however you want to look at it. So, in essence, a side effect of finding out a piece of information was you learning, <laughs> okay? Because just having access to information isn't learning. Disappointing, I know, but it isn't, all right? Although some students feel that it is. Um, I, I, actually, back in the late 90s when I was teaching, I can remember actually having to say point blank, printing out bits of the internet and putting them in a folder is not research, okay? Because that happened quite a lot. So, what would happen is you'd try and find these pieces of information out, and in that process, you'd build a kind of map of the knowledge world, okay? And you'd build context, and you'd understand how that knowledge fitted together with other things. You'd understand how things interrelated, because the node's not important, it's the connections between things. But very quickly, because of the way that Google and Wikipedia work, we've gone from this structure to what I call scattered hairballs of knowledge, okay? Do not search for hairballs on Flickr. Uh, so that was a bad afternoon, okay? Uh, this was the best one I could find. Um, and so what happens, we know, is that, we, is, is that students are asked to find out an answer to something, they Google, Wikipedia comes up, bam, they're straight to it, okay? And yet, you can use the kind of ontology in Wikipedia to find stuff. You can go down through the portal pages and content pages. I don't know how many people do that. I tried it. It's quite daunting, okay? It's quite a difficult thing to do. Most people just go straight to it. And if they're a good student, and if they're interested, they might click around a little bit, and they might produce this kind of sort of hairball of knowledge. And then they might link off somewhere else and create an, you know, another hairball. But most students won't, because they've been tasked to find an answer, and they found it. Thanks very much. So they're not constructing that ontology of knowledge, they're just finding an answer. And this is the problem. So this is a student in America who actually asked a couple of his tutors, what's your problem with Wikipedia? Because we use it all the time and it's fine, so how come you're telling us it's a problem? And he said, 
The problem is, you just get an answer. You don't actually learn anything, you just get an answer. You don't learn anything, you just get an answer. Which is intriguing, isn't it, okay? Because certainly for this tutor, getting answers wasn't learning. So that's the problem, is Wikipedia is too efficient and too good in some senses. Is that really the problem? So we come back to this statement. And hopefully, you've got a good idea of where the problem is, okay? It's the word answer. Answers are no longer relevant in an educational context, not until you're way up through your education, okay? A lot of people say, oh yeah, Wikipedia's a great starting place, but don't finish there. Well, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but until you're, you know, at least at the top of, the, of your secondary school, your high school, Wikipedia is both the starting place and the finishing place, okay? It really is. You don't have to go anywhere else. It's all there because you've done a good job. So that's the question, what's the answer? You know, how, you know that's the problem, if you like. Because I'm not going to offer you an answer because that would be ironic given what I've just been saying, okay? <laughs> um, and, and I'm serious about that. You need to ch change the way you teach, okay? This is, this is um, and I'm, I'm being facetious about this is your fault, okay? But what the education system has to do is it has to admit that Wikipedia exists and shift the way that it works. Now, one of the answers in this context is not teaching everybody to code, okay? Teaching everybody to code is a brilliant thing to do. Brilliant. The skills that you learn, it's a fantastic thing to do. But in this particular context, it doesn't necessarily help because what, what the important stuff that's happening is being played out on the surface of the wiki. It's not the wiki itself. This was something we were sort of revolving around in the earlier panel. And to my mind, teaching somebody how to code in the context of this talk is a bit like teaching somebody how to fix a car, but not how to drive the car. Do you see what I mean? Because the driving the car is the creating, curating, uh, and managing knowledge. So if that's not it, what is it? Well, it's quite simple. We need to shift from a pedagogy of answers to a pedagogy of questions. Okay? It's no longer good enough to uh, ask students to find out the answers to things if those answers are a Wikipedia page. Okay, because Wikipedia, you guys have done everybody's homework at that level. You have, it's game over, it's time to move on. So if you use that glacier metaphor, you know, the, the glacier has actually moved forward past the idea of answers up to quite a high level within your education. Because obviously, uh, you know, at, at, at a certain point, your education does become about questions but it's quite late, and what we need to do is do that earlier, okay? So we need to be using a pedagogy of questions with seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds, and not waiting until you're in your third year of your degree. And one of the ways that we can do this is by, you know, getting involved, okay? So one of the nice things about this, this talk for me is that in some ways, the, the, the solution as it, if I can call it such, is kind of what you, you're already doing. We just need to do more of it. So the education program from Wikimedia, the EduWiki people, there's a GISC ambassador, uh, Martin Poulter in the UK, that are finding ways of making it mainstream for students to either improve or create Wikipedia pages as an assigned activity, which is difficult. It's difficult because your community is a tough place to get started in, okay? It really is. It's difficult, but it's better. It's better than writing an essay because it forces the students to consider, well, what, you know, what, what, what does it mean for something to be a fact? How, what's, how can I verify this stuff? Uh, it, it, it encourages them to engage in a way that's way beyond that kind of, I just need to answer questions, so you go beyond that problem. And it, and it pushes back against that culture of think less, find more. So creating, and it, it, it's a bizarre thing because um, the education uh, industry, the sector, tends to perceive the web as simply an inconveniently chaotic library, okay? A one-way street of information. It seems to have forgotten that anybody with access can publish. Anybody with access can get involved. That's not a discussion I have very often with educators. 
But obviously, it's fundamental to Wikipedia. And if we can encourage students to feel like they've got a voice, feel like they're a legitimate participant in the curation and the creation of knowledge and moving that forward, what a fantastic thing that is. And you guys are in a position, I mean, Wikipedia can be the mechanism for that, but it's quite a difficult thing to do at the moment. So ultimately, just want to finish off by saying thank you to Wikipedia, Wikimedia, to everybody who's involved. Because as an educator, the existence of Wikipedia is not a threat to the education system. It's a massive gift. Because it allows people like me, people who teach, it allows me to move away from just trying to cram answers into people's heads and back towards what I think education should be all about, which is encouraging people to learn how to think. Thank you. Does the clicker work? I, we all know I'm really good at clicking <laughs> personally. If you want me to just stand up here the whole talk, I can do it. I got that. I feel like your dad would um, appreciate if you stayed up here and clicked. <laughs> no? Possibly. All right. Yes? Uh -oh. All right. Yes. Please welcome Jack and Draka. So I suppose my story happened way or begun way back when I was 13, which was four years ago now. And I remember I had like this terrible bowl cut and these giant glasses. And I came home one day to see my mom waiting outside of my doorway with some pretty bad news. My mom always waits outside the doorway when she has bad news. And the news had just come that my uncle, or a close family friend, had just passed from pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more, because I didn't even know where pancreas was at the time. However, I went online and I found all these statistics on pancreatic cancer and found out where pancreas was. And what I had found really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. 
And as I dug deeper, I'm like, why are we so terrible at detecting pancreatic cancer? I mean, we're in the 21st century, shouldn't we have solved this a long time ago? And while there are like um, monographies for uh, breast cancer or colonoscopies for colon cancer or that dreaded prostate exam, we don't really have anything for pancreatic cancer. The current state of the art is the 60-year-old technique. I mean, first off, that's older than my dad and far older than my rickety laptop. But also, it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate. It misses 30% of all pancreatic cancers. And your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. And that would pretty much only happen if you had a family history of the cancer as the symptoms of the cancer are like back pain or a little bit of nausea. And so I thought, well, there has to be a better way. And so I set out at age 13, armed with high school biology, to solve how are we going to detect pancreatic cancer. It was a bit lofty of a goal, but I was going to achieve it. And then I dug deeper and I found what a center for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to be successful. The center would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, inexpensive, and minimally invasive. And I was looking at these criteria, I'm like, okay, I can probably achieve this, I got this, it's a bit simpler than those multiple choice questions on my SATs. And I was going through, and I found then why we haven't updated our sensors in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for the cancer, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in protein levels. And while this sounds extremely straightforward, it's anything but, because you have liters and liters of blood that's abundant in protein, and you're looking for this tiny difference in this tiny amount of protein. It's next to impossible. However, unchecked due to my teenage optimism, or how some people like to label it, complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of cancer research, I persisted and I went to any high schooler's best sources for information, Google and Wikipedia, how I get through every high school test and quiz, and much to the view of the past talker. <laughs> but um, essentially what I found was a database of over 4,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these different cancers. And I was, it was my summer break. I literally had nothing else to do. I was pretty antisocial at the time. So I plopped down my room, locked the door, and went through all 8,000 proteins. And by the end of the summer, I was really doubting my potential to like, have any future social interactions. I made for some really interesting back to school essays. My teacher would ask like all the classmates, oh, what did you do? And my friend was like, oh, I went to Yellowstone. It was great. And then they were like, Jack, what did you do? I researched proteins all summer. It was kind of like playing Pokemon, but instead of like God catch them all, it was God reach of research them on. I didn't like level up or anything, if only. However, on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my Sandy, I identified one protein that could work. And the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just an ordinary run-of-the-mill type protein, unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer, in which case it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease, with something that's close to 100% chance of survival. So if you could detect this protein, then you could potentially detect the cancer in the earliest stage when survival was at its best. However, now the big question was, how on earth am I going to find a new way to attack this protein? And the answer came in an extremely unlikely place, high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation, in my opinion, particularly with my biology teacher, we never got along ever. And like tensions were escalating until it reached the point where I made a decisive action and snuck in an article on single walled carbon nanotubes. And these are long, thin tubes of carbon that are an atom thick, and they're 150,000th the diameter of a single strand of hair. And they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. For example, they're like stronger than steel, or they conduct electricity better than copper. You can go to the Wikipedia page for more information on them. However, 
Then we were researching about, in class, I was like supposed to be paying attention to these really cool molecules called antibodies. And that essentially, you can imagine like a lock and key. It only reacts with one specific protein. In this case, a cancer biomarker, which was the mesothelin. And I was just sitting there, kind of like feeling really suave, having this tucked in my, this article on carbon nanotubes tucked into my like biology folder or something, feeling like super like James Bond esque. And then all of a sudden it hit me. You could essentially combine these two concepts. You would have a network of these nanotubes. And then you would take these antibodies and kind of weave them into this network such that you have a network that would only react with one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these carbon nanotubes, it would actually change how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present and thus indicate whether or not you have pancreatic cancer. And how it works is akin to having a, lot of, a big bowl of spaghetti. And you can imagine all the spaghetti conducting electricity. And when you throw some meatballs in there, there are less connections between the spaghetti noodles. And what, that hap what causes that is kind of these antibodies binding to the uh, protein and causing the neighboring nanotubes to spread apart, and thus there's less connections, meaning there's higher electrical resistance. And it's actually pretty simple to measure. You just steal an ohmmeter from your dad's garage from Home Depot, and it works great, actually. And then I realized I'm probably going to need a lab for this, because you can't do cancer research on your kitchen countertop. And that's when I, I mean, me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff. Like we made like uh, high grade like um, electronics down there and like zapped ourselves and knocked out all the neighborhood's electricity. It was, my parents grounded us for like months because of that. We also like made this giant cholera culture where we make sandwiches. The CDC did not have to be called in. However, we are on the FBI watch list, but Besides that, I was like, I'm going to need a lab to do this research. So I sent out this giant document, 31 pages, to all of these professors at Johns Hopkins and the National Institutes of Health saying, please let me into your lab. And I sat back waiting for all these positive emails to pour in for me to be like hailed on Time Magazine as Kid Wonder Saves the World. And then reality struck. I got 199 rejections. And finally, like, I realized some of these professors aren't nearly as nice as those, like, glowing profile pictures of them smiling, make them look on the, like, website. They're actually really mean and, like, go through each and every, like, procedure step and say why it's the worst mistake I could make. I was like, why can't you have a regular hobby like crocheting or golfing? No, instead you make fun of 16-year-old scientific procedures, but to each their own. However, I eventually got one positive response from Dr. Anurban Maitra at Johns Hopkins University. I go in for this big interview clad in sweatpants and hoodie, and they're all dressed in suits, of course, and I'm like feeling really awkward and out of place. And then they just throw all these questions at me, trying to sync my procedure. I got through that, I guess to see, like I do on my SATs, and it worked out pretty well. I got the lab space I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized, I had no clue what I was doing. I mean, it was like the first time I went to the lab and they're like, go science, Jack. And the first day I was like, okay, I can culture some cancer cells. I nervously take out my two flasks. You literally just pour like water or the, pour the cell solution from one flask into the other flask. I screwed it up by sneezing in the second flask. And there were like tentacles growing out of it the next day, so I just kind of hid that and di denied like ever seeing that flask in my life. And I like blew up my cells in the centrifuge, or like I tripped and fell on them. It was awful. And I screwed up every procedure for seven full months, and my professor was like, why on earth did I accept this kid into my lab? But eventually, I finally ended up with one small paper sensor. Oh. Whoops, did I end up with a small... I ended up with one small paper sensor there in my hand, and it costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. And this makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times as expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when some has close to 100% chance of survival. And so far, it has over 90% accuracy. So in the next two to five years, the sensor could lift the survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100% for pancreatic cancer, 
and would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer, but could broadly be extended by essentially switching out that protein, the antibody, and you switch it out for a different antibody, and you can detect an entirely different disease, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. And the process for making these is pretty much akin to making chalk chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. All you do is you take some water, pour some nanotubes in, add some uh, like antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. It's pretty much out of like Betty Crocker. But all throughout... <laughs> Throughout this journey, I ran into a lot of difficulties. Like, my mom was like, oh, this will never work, you're 14. And apparently there are like child labor laws against me being in a lab, so they snuck me in as a volunteer. It was like really like illegal like, kind of stuff going on there. It was pretty shifty. But I got in, and then I also got told no by 199 professors. But the largest piece of, like the largest wall I ran into really was scientific paywalls. You see, 90% of all scientific research is locked tightly behind a paywall, and that means when you want to access an article, you have to cough up $35. And unfortunately for me, I don't have $35 all the time. I have like $5 a week for my allowance. But um, what we've essentially engineered with these uh, paywalls is we've created a fundamental barrier between the people and science because the general public, they want to learn. They want to learn about like, all these different scientific concepts, but they simply can't because it costs $35 and the cost of research exponentially grows because of this. And we see all these big STEM initiatives that say, oh, we need more kids and people interested in science, but when a Katy Perry single costs 99 cents and a seminal science article costs $35, I'm sorry, I'm going for that Katy Perry album and single. <laughs> But this isn't just a problem for 15-year-old cancer researchers, this is a problem for everyone. You see, recently Harvard University released a statement saying, essentially saying, we simply can't afford to continue paying for our subscriptions because they're too expensive. And that's because the subscriptions per year cost about $40,000 for a university, for one journal, and then oftentimes they bundle a bunch of journals together. So say you want just one journal, no, you have to buy like 10 more with it. And so essentially what we've created, like what, what does it say when like the world's richest, richest academic institution can't afford to continue paying for its subscriptions? What does it say about the flow of information, accessibility of knowledge and how we do science when Harvard University can't afford its knowledge and we're essentially impeding the progress of science by having these paywalls? And we've really created this really strict hierarchy in terms of a knowledge society. We have the knowledge elite, those like few universities and elite research laboratories that can access this information. And then we have the knowledge like middle class, people like me or you, who can access a few of the open access articles, those 10% of articles are open access, and maybe we read a few abstracts and chip in for a few articles. But then there's the knowledge underclass, those people who lack access to the internet and any scientific information whatsoever. And so essentially what we've created is a knowledge oligarchy where only 0.008% of the world's population, that's it. Those are the only people who can access scientific knowledge in peer-reviewed journals. And so that's like essentially taking all of the population of London, randomly select 80 people off the street, those are the only people who can read scientific articles for everyone else, too bad to be you. And but imagine if we could live in a knowledge democracy where what you look like, age or gender, doesn't apply, where whether you're from Mexico to Malaysia, from China to Cambodia, whether you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day, you could access these scientific articles because science shouldn't be a luxury and knowledge shouldn't be a commodity. It should be a basic human right. And And the minds of the people have to be free. And that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of the select few who can afford these articles. Because essentially what these scientific paywalls are is they're attacks on the curiosity and creativity of youth and the general public. 
because we have to, it's impeding us and we're essentially saying, you all, since you're not researchers, you have to pay this giant tax in order to ever learn this stuff. And that's simply not right and it's not effective because we essentially have this tier-based dissemination of knowledge where we have these knowledge elite and people and it's like saying, okay, to the like, top 10 universities, you can like, go up to calculus while the rest of you guys are relegated to only algebra. And that just isn't correct. I mean, because a girl in Pakistan should have just the same not access to knowledge as a preeminent Harvard professor, not because it's morally correct, because, or not because it's economically sound, but because it's morally correct, and that's what we call equality. And knowledge, like great ideas, don't only lend themselves to people who can afford articles, they lend themselves to everyone. Seven billion people now, not like a few million people who have PhDs. Everyone can innovate. And that's what we should do with our dissemination of scientific knowledge. And I believe that we can do this because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, I'm pretty sure we can find a new way to disseminate our knowledge. So to open access, thank you. Um, surprise of surprises, we're actually running ahead now. Uh, so if we'd like um, to take some questions, do we have any questions for Jack? I would take a selfie, but my mom took my phone. <laughs> Sorry, where? Oh, I saw a hand, I thought, but maybe not. I don't bite. Oh, back Please. there, yes. Oh, so actually um, what I've created with my friend is essentially a filter made of recycled water bottles. You just put it through a paper shredder and put it through a chemical wash. And then we've made it such that it filters out 95% of all heavy metals and pesticides in five minutes. And then you put it in boiling water for one minute and you can reclaim 90% of those contaminants and sell them back to actually profit from filtering your water. And then now I'm down at Georgetown working on nano robots that learn how to treat your cancer while they're in your body, so. More questions? More questions, any more questions for Jack? So, oh, where, yes, right here. So actually, um, in the US, we actually have this great thing that is currently in Congress called the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act. And Nick Shockey, I know he's somewhere at this conference. He's the guy who's heading up all of that. Uh, right there, stand up, Nick. I'm making you stand. So he is heading up that effort, and so if you want to get involved, he would know how to do it. And we routinely go to Congress and annoy those people there. Any more? Oh, uh, in, in the second to last row, yes? Uh, Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act, or FASTAR. Yes, F-A-S-T-R. And there was one in the red, right there. It was uh, before you started doing research, um, had you always been interested in medicine? Actually, no. Before this, I was into the environment. So, um, and before that, I was doing things with like Coke and Mentos. I was pretty boring as a kid. <laughs> Like my, I remember my elementary school was like totally anti-science. So they, instead of like science and math class, we had let's make clay pineapples class. And then after that, in my middle school years is when I started getting into scientific research. And that's because they had a Hunger Games style like science fair where they said, okay, everyone has to compete in science fair and the winner gets a laptop and everyone else gets nothing. So that was how they got us into science. And I was like, wow, this is actually like really fun, not because I'm getting all this stuff, but because I really like doing science. And then I got into medicine. Uh, one more question. Oh, right. 
Up, up in the balcony. Yeah, actually, there is this giant science fair called the Intel Science and Engineering Fest or Fair, and there's some video of me like screeching as I go up to win my award. And um, essentially, what it is is it's 1,800 kids from all over the world present their research, and a lot of them are in labs, and a lot of them are my friends. So like my friend like built a nuclear reactor when they were like 14 in their basement. I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel so dumb right now. So. Just lots of other kids also doing research. I am not like the only one, but there are many others, and it's really exciting to see all of these young people being interested in science and being pioneering through this open access, because without open access and Wikipedia, we certainly wouldn't be able to do our research. All right. Um, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, if you don't, if the science doesn't work out, you... You may have a career in stand-up. Um, <laughs> let's see what I can do. <laughs> Everyone, Jack. Thank you. And uh, go ahead and have a nice long coffee break, and we'll see you after.
Hello. Hi again. Um, we have three more fantastic speakers for you. First up, we have Diana Strassman, the chair of the Wiki Education Foundation. She is also the Carolyn and Fred McManus Distinguished Professor in the Practice at Rice University and Director of their program in Poverty, Justice and Human Capabilities. She's founding editor of the journal Feminist Economics and she's also a visiting professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Today, she's going to discuss the question, how will the Wiki Education program make Wikipedia more useful to more people? Please welcome to the stage, Diana Strassman. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I first began teaching students to edit Wikipedia in 2007, and that, along with my experiences in teaching Wikipedia in subsequent classes ultimately led me to chair the board of the new Wiki Education Foundation. I became involved in the Education Foundation because I am committed to the mission of Wikipedia and also because I believe that encouraging professors to teach their students how to write for Wikipedia is beneficial both for the students but also for Wikipedia. As those of you know who've been going to Wikipedia education, Wiki education sessions, students learn a lot from editing Wikipedia. It's different from writing a paper for a class. Instead of one professor reading the paper, students can reach hundreds or thousands of others. One of my students, as I'll mention, had, has had over 50,000 views of her work. Students also learn that just because something is in print doesn't mean that it's right or definitive. And they learn that they can offer improvements to existing representations of knowledge. And along with that come important critical thinking skills, how to question representations of knowledge, and how to learn what counts as a good source. The Wiki Education Foundation, I believe, will make Wikipedia more useful for more people. I'm an economist, and I noticed early on that Wikipedia had some pretty major gaps in content, particularly relating to women and gender. In 2007, I was teaching a course on the international political economy of gender, and decided, after noticing that there weren't very many women economists represented on Wikipedia, to ask them to create articles about important women economists. At that time, I, had, I saw that not only were women absent, but other topics that I taught about in my courses, and therefore which I thought were pretty important, also were either really terribly represented or just simply not there at all. For example, there wasn't an entry on international labor standards, an area which I, I thought was pretty important. It, it really made no sense to me that Star Wars was represented in, with every single episode. There was a lot of detail on military history or popular culture, but not too much on women's health general important topics about how to measure human well-being or on the causes of gender racial inequality. We've all seen this quote. All of us here are committed to the aims of Wikipedia, to free access to human knowledge. But we need to think about what is that knowledge? One way to think about knowledge is that it is a collection of facts, that we can just keep collecting them, put them all together, 
and have knowledge. Then if we had all the world's facts, we would have the sum total of all knowledge. The idea that Wikipedia could ever be done or completed is really based on the idea that there's a finite number of notable facts and that once they are all included, Wikipedia will be done. And related with this view of knowledge, we can think about systemic bias as the idea that if some facts are systemically omitted, such as if facts that women consider more important and useful are omitted, then we have bias just because a certain portion of the facts are missing. Well, as we think about systemic bias, we also need to think about where do gaps in content come from. Well, it's pretty widely recognized that it comes in gaps from who participates. The typical Wikipedia editor is a young white guy who is single, well-educated, and from the global north. I have to admit, that describes both of my sons. Basically, men constitute 90% of Wikipedia contributors. Well, what are some of the consequences of the gender gap in participation? These are some of the topics that my students found either absent or badly represented on the English Wikipedia. By creating or revising articles on these subjects as part of their classwork, they have been filling what I consider to be some pretty important gaps in coverage. For example, one of my students worked on the Wikipedia article on maternal health, which, before she began working on it, it was sparsely written, not well developed, and I'm proud to say it's now a much better article, and beyond that, it's had over 50,000 views. Note that overall, women are currently only about 10% of Wikipedia editors. However, classes supported by the Wiki Education Foundation include 61% women. So one of the most important things that the Wiki Education Foundation is doing to reduce the gender gap is simply greatly increasing the number of women contributors. Here's another way to think about the gaps in knowledge and their consequence. This is a slide of a map of the world around, 19, around 1570. As you can all see, the map is not complete. You know, that's the way some of us may think of Wikipedia, just not complete. And by getting more facts about the world, it's fair to say that more recently produced maps of the world are now more accurate. But the map analogy brings us to another way of thinking about knowledge, that it's a representation of reality. A map would not be useful if it were to include every single topographical detail. It would just be too big. It would be enormous and too huge to be useful in any realistic sense. And Wikipedia is the same way. And that's why we have policies about notability, since just like a map, an encyclopedia is more useful if it includes the most important rather than every single possible item that could remotely be included. It's the same with articles. What are the facts that are the most important to include in articles? But this is where judgment enters in. For what purpose is the knowledge in Wikipedia and for whom is it there? We need to think about for whom if we want Wikipedia to be useful for everyone and not just for the demographic of the typical editor. Who gets to decide what's important? Currently, it's the body of Wikipedia editors. But depending on the judgment of the majority contributors, a judgment out outcome could be to say that the world should generally be represented like this. Stanford professor and epistemologist Helen Longineau has argued in her books Science and Social Knowledge and The Fate of Knowledge 
that the objectivity of knowledge is enhanced when there is broader representation in the communities that produce the knowledge and make judgments about how it should be conceptualized and represented. That implies that the quality of Wikipedia depends critically on diverse participation in its production. Broad participation matters not just for decisions about what's important, but about how what's important is presented. So, you know, I've listed here some excerpts from the policy on neutral point of view, and if you read these, you can see there are words like what is fairly, proportionately, without bias, all of the significant views indicate the, relevant, the relative prominence of opposing views. But who will decide on what is fair and significant and what counts as a reasonable description? Will it be a group of guys like this? Would these guys come up with the same priorities for how a set of articles should be structured or which articles are high or low priority as a group like this? Maybe or maybe not. That's one reason the composition of the editorial community matters for reasons that go beyond simply adding missing content. That brings us to another theory of knowledge, that knowledge is always and inevitably partial. Or as described by scholar Donna Haraway, knowledge is situated. This view takes the position that we cannot represent knowledge independently from our partial and limited ability to know it. Standpoint theory is a related way of thinking about knowledge. It was developed by feminist scholars such as Sandra Harding as they sought to explain how existing theories often do not resonate with women's lives. Standpoint theory takes the position that people know and represent things from the context or standpoint of their own lives. I'd like to give you an example from my own field of economics. Before women entered the economics profession in large numbers, standard economic theory divided human activity into two categories, work and leisure. Work meant paid work and counted all unpaid work, such as taking care of kids, cooking, housework, etc., as leisure. I can tell you that did not resonate with women, certainly not my mother, who was a stay-at-home mom. And it certainly didn't resonate with women economists, who began entering the economics profession and began coming up with better theories. Not the, not the best theories, because there were still a lot of people left out of the economics community, as there still are. But at the end, the concept of unpaid work, thanks to the entry of different people into the profession, unpaid work is now recognized not just as legitimate, but as an important part of economies. And to be considered sound economic theory, economists are pretty much now expected to consider, for example, how an economic policy will affect not just paid work, but also unpaid work. Let's bring it back to <clears throat> Wikipedia. Here's another depiction from Wikipedia. It's a map, and it gives us another insight into how we can think of knowledge as having a narrative character. Representations of the world are often used for certain specific purposes. This map emphasizes variation in life expectancies in countries around the world. But you'll see a few things are omitted. There are no rivers. One could say that makes these maps inaccurate since, they are, since rivers are left out. One could also say that including rivers really isn't necessary for a map that's trying to make a point about life expectancy. Rivers may be notice, notable for some context, but for the purpose of this narrative, they're not. Here's another map. This one shows carbon uh, dioxide responsibility over the past half century. It's pretty useful for, for providing insight into carbon issues, but like all maps, it's partial. No rivers. 
I'd now like to take an example from a Wikipedia article that a couple of my students worked on. Before they worked on it, basically the article told a story about how hot American politicians were, that is, the women ones. My students had a different standpoint about how much hotness should be emphasized in an article on women in government. So they rewrote the article. And I'll let you know, they got some pushback from a Wikipedian who actually thought the information on women's physical attractiveness should be included as the major emphasis. But fortunately, my students' references came from more reliable sources, so they prevailed. More generally, students supported by the Wiki Education Foundation are adding missing content and challenging ways of narrating articles that they consider misguided. But it's also revealed that bias in Wikipedia isn't just about what's missing, it's also about bias and what's included. This article is about gender inequality in El Salvador that was created by a student of a friend of mine and colleague who co-edits feminist economics with me, Gunsli Barrick at the University of Utah. After her student finished working on the article, another Wikipedian decided to embellish it with this photo. Well, I have to tell you, I've checked Wikipedia. There are many articles of fully clothed women from El Salvador that could have better illustrated the article. But, you know, I'd like to say this is the only time this has happened to one of my students or a student of um, another professor being supported by the Wiki Education Foundation, but there are actually a lot, quite a few existing Wikipedia editors who undermine the work of students by doing things like this. Well, as I've noted, broad participation in Wikipedia is important. But even if we all agree that it is important, diversity doesn't just happen. In addition to bringing in more women student editors, another thing that the Wiki Education Foundation is doing to help is by facilitating more engagement between Wikipedia and universities. We need to recognize that scholars have been pondering issues about power and knowledge for centuries, and that engagement with experts on the various strands of literature on these topics at universities can help Wikipedia better address these kinds of concerns. Some of you, for example, might be interested to read the work of Michel Foucault, who wrote a book called The Order of Things, among many other very important books which have great relevance for Wikipedia. I'm going to talk briefly about one example from sociolinguistics to show how learning from and engaging with academia can help Wikipedia learn how to improve the encyclopedia. Sociolinguists have pointed out that potential participants in social communities note whether they are welcome participants based on quite a few factors. And the first is, who is already there? If you are attending a forum and see that it is all male, or all white, or all American, or Western, and see that there is no one like you, you are less likely to see yourself as an expected and welcome participant. Any forum that contains few or a substantial minority of women, or people of color, people from the global south, cannot expect to bring people in from the missing groups just by inviting them. They will look around and get the, get the message. So we should bring this insight to Wikipedia and consider if there's a panel at a Wikipedia conference or a group of people given some kind of authority in the community, it matters if the people are highly dominated from a narrow demographic group. Second, the very language we use signifies who is an expected and therefore welcome participant. Another concept from sociolinguistics 
has to do with what assumptions we make about what does not need to be said. These are called default assumptions. They're basically the assumptions that people in shared communities make about what isn't said. So just to give an example, if a people are talking about a park and implicitly expect that everyone will, who is there knows that there will be grass in the park and that it will be green and that people will know this even if they don't mention that the park contains green grass, what they are signifying through their omission of this detail is that they don't expect that some of the community participants have lived all their lives in a desert. So similarly, if people talk as though no one will ever work for free, they are signifying through their language that they don't count unpaid activities like editing Wikipedia or taking care of children as real work. Community rules can be a third way of signifying whom we anticipate and indeed want as a participant. Rules structure how people can participate, but when they're produced by a narrow demographic group, they may not lead to results that serve the interests of the broader community. For example, it's common for governments to create rules that end up, intentionally or not, disenfranchising large groups of people. I'd like to call on all of us to think about how Wikipedia's rules and policies might, in some cases, be having unintended consequences. In thinking about what we do in Wikipedia, we also need to recognize that when we welcome the ideas and participation of others, we must also give up something that we all normally view as pretty important. That is, our generally sincerely held beliefs that our own views are spot on correct. But if we want Wikipedia to be as good as it possibly can be, and serving the interests of as many people as possible, we need to be open to the possibility that someone else, not currently part of our group, might have an idea that could cause us to see things differently. And we must be willing to share power with those who have different points of view. As philosopher Helen Longino has pointed out, we get objectivity not from an individual following a specific method, but rather through the work of a community of inquirers who are willing to hold up their ideas to broad critical scrutiny and who are together willing to accept potentially transformative critiques. That's the true ideal of science. And therefore, if we want Wikipedia to be truly objective, to be the best encyclopedia it possibly could be, we need to do better in figuring out how to open up participation in our community. And we need to welcome change. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, oh, I, I left it. Um, I found a lens cap of a Sony camera, and I know that that is a very irritating thing to lose. So if anyone has lost their lens cap, I've got it. Anyone? Okay, I'll put it in lost and found. Uh, next, we have Claire Sutcliffe. She is the co-founder and CEO of Code Club, which is a UK-wide network of after-school coding clubs for children aged 9 to 11, which launched in April 2012. She also worked as art, an art director and a user experience designer, and she's going to speak to us about how people power her organization. And she's still getting mic'd up, so I will... 
I will fill. Everyone check your camera bag to see if it is indeed your lens cap. No? Ready? Nope, not ready. That's okay. No, not yet. Uh, anyone? I have a question. I've been curious about this all conference. Who thinks that they may have traveled the farthest to be here at Wikimania? Shout it out. Anyone? Anyone come from very far away? No? You all live in, in East London? No? What? Yes? Oh, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Okay, she said, she said, we've all traveled our entire lives just to get to this place. <laughs> Thank you. you. You win the insightful and poetic audience thought of the day awards. Your prize is, it's a, it's a lens cap that I found. Uh, are you ready, Claire? Fantastic. Please welcome Claire Sutcliffe. <laughs> Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, back in 2012, I was a user experience designer, and I traveled to a web design conference in Nottingham, where I had a conversation with a creative technologist called Linda Sandvik about learning to code. And I was surprised to learn that in the UK, children aren't given the chance to create and play with code at school. I was interested in whether it was even possible to learn this so young, so I did a little survey. I asked 1,500 programmers, at what age did you start learning to code? And 69% of them said they were under the age of 14 when they started. So that showed me it's totally possible to start learning when you're young. But what was really interesting was the reasons why they got started. 62% said that making things was what got them started, and that broke down into websites, simple programs, and games. Further research revealed that there were a whole bunch of reasons why it's good for kids to learn to code. It's creative and fun. It empowers them to bring their imaginations to life. It improves their problem-solving skills, and it's a really good support for other subjects like science and maths. It gives them an opportunity to apply their knowledge to something real and creative. Children today have grown up with technology, but they will always just be con passive consumers unless they're taught to create for themselves. And so we had an idea. What if we sent programmers to primary schools to run after-school coding clubs with pre-written projects that would teach kids to code? But this was such a simple idea, so why didn't it already exist? Well, we were about to find out. We identified the main problems. First of all, there were no projects that were publicly available and appropriate for this age group, and no one had any time to write them. There was no group to belong to. Approaching a school on your own can be a bit intimidating. And there was no way to communicate with schools so we set about trying to solve those problems. First of all, we decided we will write projects to give to volunteers. No big deal. Next, we'll create a network, a brand, and a movement for people to belong to so they don't feel so alone. And we'll create a platform and a communication tool to allow them to communicate with schools more easily. And so Code Club was born a not-for-profit, nationwide network of volunteer-led after-school coding clubs for children aged 9 to 11. And this is how it works. We send volunteer programmers to their local primary school with projects that we've written to teach 9 to 11-year-old children, and that is what makes a code club. Our goals are to have children leave Code Club with the desire and the ability to pursue digital making and a useful set of skills for their future hobbies, education, and career. And it's our aim to have a club in 25% of UK primary schools by the end of 2015. So what does a Code Club look like? Well, this is Code Club at Soho Parish School. That's Simon on the top left. He's the most adult-looking one. <laughs> And the kids with the yellow bits of paper are holding their level one and two certificates. We like to co-design the program with children, so Hannah, Effie, and Edward are all on our junior advisory board. 
We use Scratch to teach in the first two terms. Scratch, if you don't know, was created by MIT Media Lab for children to learn the concepts of programming without any fiddly syntax. It has a drag and drop interface where you drag, drag blocks from the left into the center, they click together into scripts, and that controls the action, what's going on on the stage. We move on to teaching HTML and CSS in term three. This is my favorite example. I love chinchillas. Uh, chinchillas are cute, it says at the bottom. Have you seen a chinchilla before? If you have, you're really cool. Thank you. I think all websites should be like that, personally. I'd be a lot happier. We move on to teaching Python, and we do that through playing with turtles, drawing fractals, cracking codes, and creating 2D Minecraft. And Minecraft is very popular. If you've met a child recently, you will know that. That's our 2D Minecraft. Our projects are designed with children in mind. They're colorful, they keep them on track with basic exercises and challenges then that stretch their thinking and encourage them to apply what they've learned so far. All our projects are free, open source, and available online at projects.coclub.org.uk. So please have a look at them. Just after we launched, we made a video with some of our new supporters, which I'll show you now for a little light relief. Your name? My name is Niklas Sjöström. So why would you like to work at Code Club? I have made a few um, software, done um, something called Skype. I think I have Anything a else? Well, I have a few others, but they were not as big, but... Uh, my name is Joanna Shields. Uh, what do you think you can do for Code Club? I was chief executive of a company called Bebo. Justin Bieber? Um, no, actually a company called Bebo. Mm. Next. As you know, Code Club is an after-school activity aiming to teach children the basics of coding. What do you think you bring to the table? Well, I'm Chad Hurley. I uh, created YouTube. Oh, I know. Did you, did you do that one where the baby bites the other baby's finger? No, I, d I don't make videos. Next. Tessa Jowell. Actually, it's Dane Tessa Jowell. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, Brent and Martha. Um, we, 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 we started, started lastminute.com. Last Next. Mm -hmm. Sit down. What's your name? I'm Tim Berners-Lee. What do you think you bring to the table? I invented the, the World Wide Web. Anything else? Anything else? Well, that. Next. Um, we were hoping for Prince Harry to be honest with you, Mr. Windsor. So why would you like to work for Code Club? I think it's a, a, a very useful skill, uh, for, particularly for people like yourselves and young people. And I think it opens up huge opportunities in the future. And I suppose I know some influential people. Like who? My mother. You're hired! Yeah, so that was a lot of fun to make, as you can imagine. I feel I should mention that those children hated saying Justin Bieber like they liked them, like for the sake of their own <laughs> reputation. They were like, do we have to? I was like, I'm really sorry. Anyway, <laughs> so over 600,000 people saw that, which put Co Code Club in the public eye, which is exactly what we wanted. And it meant that we could start with um, 120 clubs in September 2012. And we've grown by an average of 100 clubs a month since then. So we have almost 2,100 clubs in the UK so far. Um, and there are about 15 children in each club. And 40% of the children that attend Code Club are girls, which we're really pleased with. So 2,100 is actually only 10% of the 21,000 primary schools in the UK. And we're aiming for 25%, which is this big. So we still have a lot of work to do. Some people have asked us how we've managed to grow so quickly, and the simple answer is people power. And I'm going to point out with this sledgehammer-esque sticker how you can join in and get involved with our movement. The most important people are our volunteers. Without them, there would be no clubs. They run after school clubs, they contribute to projects on GitHub, and they run their own local meetups. And they tell us over and over again 
how running a club is the most rewarding part of their week. And you can join in by volunteering to run a club, contributing to projects, and spreading the word to technology companies that you know, asking them to volunteer too. We work with schools by consulting with teachers and working with their traditional infrastructure to introduce a non-traditional subject. As a result, there is a lot of demand. There are currently over 700 schools looking for a volunteer in the UK alone. And you can join in by spreading the word to your local schools. Teachers can run clubs themselves, and a lot of them do. So please let them know. We work with industry and granting organizations who finance our work and magnify our message. They mean that we can stay free to schools and free to parents, removing any economic barrier that would stop a child attending a code club. And you can join in by talking to technology companies that you know um, who want to make an impact on the future of education, future education of children in this country and around the world. We work with local government to reach out to their schools and we work with local universities and colleges to give their students the opportunity to volunteer for us. And you can join in by spreading the word and talking to your local university and local government and alerting them to the opportunities that we have on offer. We also work with people we've never met before. We ask them, we ask non-volunteers, what is stopping you from volunteering for Code Club at the moment? And reason one was, I'm not sure my boss would let me leave early. That's fair enough, bosses can be mean. Reason two, I have no experience of working with a group of children. I can see how that might be worrying. Reason three, I don't know what it's like to run a code club, so I'm a bit scared and intimidated by that. And that's fair enough as well. So let's solve those problems. We, went, we tried to co-design these solutions with our volunteers. First of all, a convince your boss document to show your boss that not only are you doing good for the local community by running a co-club near your work, but also it's going to be improving your employees' skills as well. It's a win-win. Next, we're designing an online training course for our volunteers to show them what a modern British primary school looks like and what a modern British 9 to 11-year-old looks like. It's not scary, it's fine. And we're creating a network of star clubs. These are clubs that we've vetted and checked that, that volunteers are awesome so that new volunteers or potential volunteers can go and shadow these clubs and see what running a club is like before deciding, I will definitely run my own code club. So 50% of our volunteers are teachers from within the schools themselves. And they say that cone club, running a cone club is really good for their continuing professional development, but they really want more training especially as the new computing curriculum comes into effect in September 2014. And that is only a month away. That is going to require primary school teachers to teach computer science to key stages one to three, and that's ages five to 14. And that's, and that's making a lot of teachers quite nervous considering they don't have the, um, the subject knowledge in the first place. But we thought, we have access to thousands of volunteer computing experts already. How can we work with them to deliver professional training to teachers? And so we launched Code Club Pro at the beginning of this year to provide training and resources for primary school teachers of the new, comp of the new computing curriculum. We will train volunteers to deliver effective continuing professional development all over the UK Teachers will tell us if and where they want training, and then we'll match them geographically, just like we do with Code Club UK. We worked with teachers to write our training sessions and test them in pilot schools, and we made sure they're engaging, useful, and fun. Here, our trainer is explaining binary with paper hats. And I'm gonna let you tell, the I'm gonna let the teachers from our first pilots tell you what they think of our training. Code Club Pro is very different to any other training that we have simply because usually we already have lots of knowledge and understanding of how to teach this thing and it's usually about a very specific area whereas this is actually like bringing a whole new curriculum subject in. Some of the programs that we had to use I had never used before such as Scratch and because it has an element of programming in it and I'm nowhere near a programmer it did make me think hmm how's this gonna go. Once we started using it, it was really broken down by the presenter. Um, they made it really simple. I feel a lot more confident about it now than I did when we first started. So what I think the programme did really well was to explain why this is relevant and to give it a purpose. 
I can see enormous benefits to the children now. It's so much more interesting than opening a Word document and typing your name and changing the font. I am much more optimistic about what the computing curriculum is going to be and what we're going to be addressing. So it's really helped. I suppose there's lots of different parts to it. Some parts you just really needed to sit and listen. Other parts of it, it was more of the more I practiced, the less I listened almost. It was fun and engaging, but at the right times. <laughs> it's the knowledge behind all of the other jazzy, teachy stuff that you're going to put onto it. It's the knowledge that backs it up. Lessons have been really well planned. I think uh, the thought behind them has been really well planned out and I think uh, the schools will find it interesting and challenging and also enjoyable and entertaining. So I would recommend it. I'm really, really pleased that we've managed to create something that teachers enjoy. <laughs> when we first started this project, we were told that teachers hate being trained. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> how can we not bore them to death and make this fun? We've really got to make it fun. So I'm really glad there's so many smiles in that video. Um, we have four modules over Key Stage 1 and 2 because we're still focusing on primary schools, which is what we know best. Um, our modules um, aim to give teachers the subject knowledge in computing that they need and confidence that they'll be able to teach this subject to their class too. By 2015, we're aiming to have over 400 teachers working in the UK, trainers working in the UK, delivering training sessions to teachers and hopefully affecting the education of over 100,000 children. If you have computing knowledge, you can volunteer to train teachers, and if you don't, you can spread the word about the offer of training to your local schools. Um, about a year ago, I started getting a lot of emails about Code Club from other people around the world, and they said, when are you going to come and start Code Club in my country? But the most interesting one said, when can I start Code Club in my country? And so we created Code Club World, which is a framework allowing other people to support local volunteers in their own country. And we have over 2,580 Code Clubs running around the world, and that includes the ones in the UK. And you can join in by starting a club in the country where you live. And you can find more advice about that on codeclubworld.org. We have national communities starting up all around the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, Catalonia, Hong Kong, Brazil, Ukraine, Norway, and South Africa. And we're aiming to have 100 Code Club national communities running by the end of 2018. And that is about 50% of the world's countries. No big deal. So, if you're up for the challenge, you can lead Code Club in your country, and you can come and talk to me about how much fun it is and how much it will take over your life. <laughs> the first term of Code Club projects have been translated into Brazilian Portuguese, Dutch, French, German, Norwegian, Polish, Spanish, Swedish, and Ukrainian so far. But you can join in by translating our projects into the languages that you speak. Just go on GitHub and get involved. Now, as terrifying as it might seem, these children are the inventors of your future but not without your help. Code Club is a movement, and it's people-powered. There is at least one way that every single one of you can help power us forward. If you're in the UK, you can volunteer to run a club, you can contribute to our projects, and you can help us find financial support so we can keep going. You can volunteer to train teachers and tell your local school about training. You can volunteer to run a club in a country outside of the UK, translate our projects, become a national leader, and help us find financial support to continue that country's work as well. And if you can't do any of those, then the least you can do is spread the word to the people who can. Thank you very much. And as I finish five minutes early, you can tweet about Code Club and tell everyone about it now. Thank you. Because we, because she did finish, we do have time for questions. I will run around with the microphone. Uh, I may even take off my shoes to do this. There we go. All right. I'm just like Oprah. This is amazing. Uh, 
hello, Claire. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an awesome project. I've always supported it. Code Cub Pro, uh, the first time I heard about it was just here now. Do you extend that material beyond the teaching profession? When you say it's available open source, online, is it material that can be used in um, industries other than education? Yes, it will be. The Code Club Pro resources will be open, but we will be changing in them so they're more useful to people because our current resources are for our trainers to right. deliver sessions. So we're going to be um, hopefully writing those up so that they're more useful to people to just read for themselves as well. Okay. Yeah. I have worked on a project that is trying to educate the non-programmer members of, of a company like the design staff or the marketing staff in the problems of the, the software engineers. So I'd love to talk to you about that maybe. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. What license do you use? Uh, Creative Commons, share alike. I uh, can't remember. <laughs> it's on the bottom of all our projects, so I should really know it off by heart. <laughs> it's the, same, the same one that Wikipedia uses. I believe so, yeah. I can check for you though afterwards. Um, brilliant, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Such a fantastic project. But, so um, I was wondering, you said you've got obviously pro for like, um, teaching teachers and making them more comfortable uh, with the material. Uh, do you also uh, have, shall we say, wi willing members of the public? Say, for instance, people are CRB checked, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore be able to work in a teaching environment? Uh, I don't quite understand. So, so, so from the point of view, do you... Uh, say people who don't have a programming background but who want to get involved in helping the project, is there an avenue for them to get involved? Um, in Code Club Pro or in, in Code Club in general? It, that's a really interesting question because we know that at some point we will run out of people who have the um, programming knowledge and the flexibility of time to be able to run a Code Club. So it's something that we're looking at at the moment is how can we bring non-programmers on board to, to volunteer? Um, at the moment, we say you do need some knowledge. Um, but we're hoping to find a way, <laughs> basically, yeah. And for Code Club Pro, you definitely do need it, yeah. One more. Uh, oh, over here. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I'm, I'm afraid I'm one of those persons who ends up having to teach these people when they get to university that what they learned about programming is completely wrong. Uh, and we have to sort of start over with the math. I wanted to ask if you're also looking into the, the use of computers and what problems come up when, for example, the UK government uh, stores all of the data that, is, that people uh, produce, uh, telephone calls. Is there any focus on this or is it just on, on the happy fun things of, of making web pages and uh, animations using Scratch? That is, are you looking at the effects that computing have on society? on privacy and things like that, because I think these would be important things to be teaching this to the kids as well. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, we don't actually to, like teach any ethics specifically at Code Club. Um, that's kind of something that their teachers will do in their own, in like within the computing curriculum, is talk about, um, about how computers are used. Um, so we do focus on the creation, yeah. Any others? Yeah? Uh, okay, one more, one more. Uh